Thank you. So, you know, um, how you end up giving talks like this one. Um, there are a couple of things that happened this past year that caused me to end up giving this particular talk. Uh, those of you who read the talk description will understand the sort of principal reason, and we'll get into more detail about that shortly. Um, but the other reason that I'm here giving this talk is that um, I got this wonderful communication from uh, Linux Australia and from the program committee and so forth right around the time the CFP was closing, uh, saying, gee, deal, we haven't seen any talk submissions from you this year. And I had one of those, oh, I just can't think about that right now sorts of reactions. And um, when I said that, you know, I think trying to, to, to be nice to me, they said, uh, well, under the circumstances, would you like an extension on the paper submission deadline? And I said, that's really very nice of you. I just can't imagine sort of having the time to come up with something that was talk worthy to, to you know, would, would sort of justify that kind of treatment. And um, one of the folks I replied and said, oh, come on now, b -Dale. you're going through an experience right now that you are bound to learn some interesting lessons from that you know, we'd like to hear about um, if you'd be willing to do it. <clears throat> and so for better or for worse, I said, okay, I guess I could try to do that. And um, so here I am. Um, what I wanna do today, you know, look, I've been involved in the IT world for a long time and for 10 or 12 years of that career, I actually managed a group that maintained all of the computing and networking infrastructure for a non-trivial little slice of old HP, uh, R&D and manufacturing organizations. And so I spent way more than my share of time, you know, helping to write and review disaster recovery plans for, you know, a major corporation. Um, and not surprisingly, some of that rubbed off on me. <clears throat> so at least a few of the lessons that I learned through that process have percolated into the management of my personal infrastructure and the things that sort of matter the most to me. But um, for better or for worse, uh, nothing always goes exactly the way you expect. And there probably are a couple things that <clears throat> I learned in the process of recovering from the events of last June that you know, maybe you'll learn something from uh, too. Um, it is sort of traditional though that um, <clears throat> when I give talks at places like LCA that there's at least one or two uh, rocket photos and <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> I will admit that there are a couple of non-gratuitous rocket photos in this presentation. It's sort of part of the story of what happened after the fire. So without a whole lot more ado, um, let me ask a couple of questions. Um, so first of all, how many, by show of hands, how many of you back up your computers? Liars. <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, more serious question. Of those of you that back up your computers, how many of you do something to get your essential data offsite? Right. <coughs> <coughs> you know, I would have been one of the people who raised my hand on that too. Um, it was a little embarrassing when I finally got to my bank to the safe deposit box and realized that the last snapshot of financial data I had put there was 12 years old. <coughs> <laughs> You get busy, you know? So um, the most important question is, if someone called you right now and said, gosh, sorry, your house is gone, would that be completely devastating to you? I mean, is that what, if somebody asked me earlier today or yesterday, gee, B. Dale, if that happened to me, I don't know if I could go on, how do you do it? I mean, would it be that kind of devastating or would it just be a really bad day? Think about it, okay? Because this sort of colors, <clears throat> you know, it's certainly colored some of my thinking since all of this happened. And I think it's, you know, at some point, all of these things boil down to, you know, some element of risk management. How much do you think you could deal with and what would you want to have preserved one way or another if you found yourself in a circumstance like this so you didn't feel like you couldn't go on? So what exactly happened? Well, on the afternoon of... Uh, the 11th of June, my daughter and I were sitting in our living room at our house in Black Forest, Colorado, um, which some of you <coughs> in the room have visited before, uh, reading email and catching up on things. My wife and son were off at the ice skating rink because he's an ice dancer and had a, a practice session. And all of a sudden, we smelled a little whiff of smoke. Um, you know, the kind of thing you might smell if somebody had a barbecue going in the neighborhood. That seemed a little strange, didn't think much about it. And then, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 30 seconds later, there was a big whiff of smoke. And it's like, that's not 
a grill. We both sort of looked at each other, jumped up, ran outside, uh, looked out, and this is what we saw. That, those are not clouds. That's a freakishly large column of smoke that's mm, certainly less than a kilometer away from the house. And there began what ended up being sort of a really crazy adrenaline pumped afternoon. Um, it was interesting because <clears throat> in the first minute or so that we sort of stood there transfixed looking at it, we didn't hear much and it didn't seem like things were particularly moving in our direction. But I realized very quickly that, you know, wow, maybe one of the neighbor's houses is burning or something. I went running down the driveway to see if I could see a little more about what was going on, maybe, you know, lend a hand to help or something. And uh, as I got to the end of my fairly long driveway, uh, there was a second or third fire department arriving, responding to the call. And one of the fire guys immediately looked at me and said, do you live down there? And I said, yes. And he said, well, if there's anything you care about down there, you should get it out right now. And that's exactly how much warning I had. We didn't receive evacuation orders. We were too close to the point of origin. Uh, by the time they started doing reverse 911 phone calls and all of that, they'd already killed all the power to our neighborhood and everybody was either not there because it was the work day and they were <clears throat> nowhere near home or like us, they were frantically trying to, to cope. I don't actually know how much time we spent putting things into a vehicle. Um, somewhere, you know, at least 20 minutes, maybe as much as an hour. I just don't know. The reason I don't know is my whole sense of time went nuts. There's something about running on that much adrenaline. Uh, every time we looked down the driveway and could see smoke and flames right sort of down at the end of the driveway and <clears throat> hadn't yet found the second cat and knew that we really couldn't leave without her. Um, you know, the stress level is pretty high. We did eventually, however, find the second cat, got her in her carrier, threw her in the back of the Suburban and went to take off. And as we turned the corner at the bottom of the hill in our driveway and went to go up, this is what we saw. Um, that photo, you can't see it, but as soon as you got past what you could see there, um, there was a wall of firefighters and flames and stuff had jumped the road and all of that. Um, <clears throat> actually right there is active flame and all of that stuff underneath those trees is either on fire or is just burned. That's the side of my driveway. So by the time we went to leave, <coughs> that's how close the fire was to our house. So what ended up happening was because there's only one road out <coughs> and the fire had already, due to high winds, been pushed across the road and we weren't able to drive out, the fire guys, after scratching their heads a little bit, said, okay, um, park your vehicles here on your neighbor's property and we will walk you out through the area that's already burned. And so my daughter and I, um, sort of following directions, took the least we thought we had to carry, which is one cat carrier each, cell phone, keys, and wallets, and that was pretty much it. I was literally wearing the pair of Tevas and pair of shorts that I'm wearing today. I was not wearing this t-shirt, I was wearing a drag racing t-shirt. <coughs> And that's what I had when I walked out. We got dropped off after a substantial amount of walking and then being uh, sort of handed off between a couple of different fire groups that were going out to refill their vehicles and replenish to come back and fight some more at an intersection. It's just about two miles away from the house. And that's what it looked like looking back in the direction of our house. Uh, in case there's any doubt, my house is just to the left of where that freakishly large pile of smoke is. Um, even at this point, <coughs> it was a little surreal. It's like, well, that's bad, but it doesn't look that horrible. And there's a gazillion firefighters and there's, you know, a steady stream of water trucks coming and going. And, ah, you know, they'll, they'll get this under control. Um, by 930 that night, this is what the view from the other side of Colorado Springs looked like of Black Forest. And, uh, you know, it didn't get a whole lot better for a little bit. So just to give you a few statistics, <clears throat> the fire started around 1 p.m. local time on Tuesday, the 11th of June. Uh, by the time the fire had burned itself out or had gotten under control, uh, something like 94,000 acres, which I'm told is 380 square kilometers, had been evacuated. That's about 13,000 homes, about 38,000 people. Uh, this fire did start in a semi-rural residential you know, part of this particular forested area. There's something around 500 firefighters involved. I saw numbers 
I think it one, uh, the most they ever had fighting at one time was 457 or something like that, but um, I don't actually know exactly. Uh, they declared the fire as fully contained on the 20th of June. <coughs> um, to the best of my understanding, uh, our house actually caught fire early in the morning of Thursday the 13th. It's kind of interesting. It wasn't the day the fire started, even though it started so close. That's because it started just south of us and the wind was blowing at hard east. Um, later, the winds changed and it kind of got blown back. Both of those times, the firefighters managed to keep the fire away from our house. Unfortunately, at about 4 o'clock in the morning on the 13th, there was a flare-up just southwest of us when the winds went to about 40 miles an hour at you know, 4 in the morning when there's no uh, air support uh, for dropping water or anything. Apparently, my house ended up under an ember plume that was something like a quarter of a mile long, <clears throat> and it was embers in the middle of the night that ignited the house. There was a scanner log entry from about 4.35 that morning where they said, you know, darn, another house is burning. And I'm pretty sure that was my house, though I don't absolutely know for sure. By the time it was all done, <clears throat> I had plenty of company. Uh, there's something, the numbers seem to vary, you know, in terms of exactly which ones you believe. I've heard everything from a low of 486 to a high of 511 homes uh, completely destroyed. There were a bunch more that were damaged. Uh, unfortunately, two people died. And that's sad both because, you know, they were just normal people trying to get their stuff loaded and get out. And from what I understand, it seems like the fire jumped over them, surrounded them, and they were probably asphyxiated, but nobody, I don't really know for sure. But the other negative consequence of this is that all investigation of the fire's point of origin is therefore a criminal investigation until such time as they can prove it was not intentionally set. <clears throat> um, it has to be treated as if this were, you know, a murder, manslaughter, whatever investigation. So we were finally let back into our property on the 21st of June, <clears throat> and that's what it looked like. It's not a whole lot of fun. <clears throat> now, I understand that, you know, we're not the only people who've ever had this happen to us. Certainly here in Australia, I think you are perhaps better prepared to understand uh, the ravaging power of wildfire than a lot of folks, even in the U.S. Um, but certainly in the desert southwest, in the states of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah, we're kind of accustomed to having some of the same treatment that you see in some of your drier portions of Australia. But <clears throat> that's not a whole lot of fun to come back to. A couple little things that you might notice in here. I don't know if I have a better way to point, but uh, up on the left-hand side against the wall about halfway back is the milling machine I gave a talk about in Wellington. Um, <coughs> that was a very fine example of German automotive engineering. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, so was that. That was my son's project car, and uh, more about that later. Here's another view of what things were like afterwards. This was uh, the Altus Metrum World Headquarters and um, my office and so forth in the basement of the house. You notice the swing gate rack on the wall back there that had the networking gear in it and just the side of it a couple of racks that had things and these are all shelves and you know my work benches and the RF and microwave test bench was sort of over in that corner. To give you an idea, the insurance guy said that uh, normally uh, when they see a house fire, they expect the temperatures to have been somewhere in the range of 2,000 to 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry I didn't think in advance about trying to convert that. They say that in my house, though, it's pretty clear they were above 3,000. <clears> and some of that has to do with the fact that the wind was howling, it was a wood frame house, there was a tuck under garage, and once the garage door went, it would have had some kind of a chimney effect going on. There might have been an accelerant or two somewhere in the structure. <laughs> <laughs> there were no explosives, <clears throat> but there might have been some fast burning solids. Um, <clears throat> in any case, um, you know, it's a mess. And uh, it's definitely not the sort of thing you want to come home to. You'll notice that's a su substantial steel beam back there, a support beam across the corner that had just kind of bent like a noodle. Um, it's very interesting to see copper wiring that's completely burned and gone. Um, anything that was aluminum, um, we found in sort of blobs of liquid on the floor. Um, the one thing, I didn't think to stick a photo in, but the one really cool thing that my son has left from his project car is the piece of Art Deco, modern art, whatever you want to call it, that was once the um, engine's block and oil pan. Um, 
But yeah, it's all you know, kind of like that. So look, when something like this happens, <clears throat> have you thought about what you would grab if you had to leave in a hurry? If you haven't, this is probably the biggest thing I would suggest you spend a little conscious time on. And you know, engage your significant other, the rest of the family, and talk about it. There's some stuff that everybody seems pretty certain to either grab or have or want to grab. Uh, everybody we've talked to <coughs> has asked about photo albums. Because after all, particularly in the pre-digital era, you know, photos were sort of unique. They're, they're the story of your life, as somebody once said. And if you don't have them, <coughs> um, it's very hard to get them back. It's a little easier these days with digital cameras. They're, you're more likely to have a copy of the bits somewhere, but probably on your laptop, <coughs> probably on a server in the basement. Um, maybe a few of the best ones, you know, are stuck out in a server farm in California somewhere or something. Um, I'm sure they're all in Utah, but <coughs> not always so easy to get from there. Uh, jewelry. Um, my wife had uh, some heirloom jewelry and uh, you know, hand-me-downs from her mother and grandmother and so forth, and that probably had more emotional significance to her than anything else. She put it very near the top of the list. Uh, unfortunately, there were some other super sentimental things for her that um, hadn't really made it into my mental list, which I uh, will get to spend the rest of my life being reminded of. Um, <coughs> and for me, not surprisingly, um, the most important stuff in the house were the three most important gag.com servers. Um, and oh yeah, notebooks would be nice too. But um, when you host sort of most of your life yourself on a couple of servers sitting in your house or apartment, it's surprising how much that particular set of spindles can mean to you. Well, there's probably some things you haven't thought about as much. Um, if you're evacuated, you really want your own mobile phone charger. Um, I can't, you know, e even in this modern era where everything sort of takes a micro USB cable, let me tell you, if you are wedged into somebody else's house as a host family along with a second evacuated family, um, you know, <clears throat> having to sort of schedule who's going to recharge what when gets old in a hurry. Um, identity documents. I actually, fortunately, my wife and I had literally two days earlier come home from our 25th wedding anniversary trip, and that was great, by the way. Would have loved to have basked in the glory a little longer. <clears throat> but a pleasant consequence of that is her passport was still in my computer shoulder bag. And so when I grabbed my laptop and threw it in the vehicle, um, I did end up with both her and my passports there. My daughter had hers, my son has, had expired, so that was all cool. Uh, of course, and then they ended up in the vehicle that we had to park and walk away from. Not so cool. Um, I didn't think about the key to our safe deposit box at the bank, where all the birth certificates and marriage certificate and all that stuff are. Um, you'll be shocked to hear that when we were allowed back to the site, the very first thing I did was drop a ladder down in that corner of the basement, go to that drawer in what was left of my desk, and I found that key. And uh, I'm even more pleased to report that it worked once before it twisted into nothingness. <coughs> and so I didn't get stuck having to have the box drilled. I was actually able to get into it. But that, for the week or so that I didn't know if I'd be able to find that, that was pretty harsh personally. So you might think about things like that. And sort of related to all of that, um, if you find yourself dealing with something like this, um, bank account numbers, insurance policy numbers, contact information for all the important people in your life. That stuff really matters. And so I strongly suggest having it in a couple of different forms um, <clears throat> and available to grab in a hurry. Next thing, what's your insurance like? Um, it's an unfortunate reality that in the Black Forest area of Colorado, a lot of folks were grossly underinsured. Some of this is because there were people who were second, third, maybe even fourth generation living in the same piece of property. You know, the mortgage had been paid off years ago. They didn't owe anybody any money for the property. They were just paying taxes and insurance, and that meant the insurance was a big part of what they were paying. And so they weren't paying for any more of it than they absolutely had to. Um, that kind of hurts when all of a sudden it's gone. Um, there were probably people who weren't insured at all. There's sort of five pieces to the insurance that I had. I was fortunately one of the lucky ones. I don't know why, but I made some good choices a bunch of years ago, 26 and a half years ago when I bought that house. 
<coughs> there, you know, each policy sort of has, at least in the US, and I assume it's very similar here, there are different coverages for the structure, the primary structure, for the contents, your personal property. Um, for, in my case, we had coverage for loss of use of the structure, which I didn't even realize. I had never really read that part of my policy. Um, and by the way, loss of use means that, you know, insurance company's paying for the apartment that we're living in right now and will continue to pay for that until the replacement house is built, which is pretty cool. Um, there's some coverage for outbuildings, secondary structures, they're called. <coughs> and um, that it was kind of intriguing. The insurance company even looked at my son's fort way down in the corner of the property, which was badly fire damaged. And um, the adjuster sort of looked at me and I looked at him like, we're not going to have this conversation, are we? And um, he said, I have two questions for you. And I said, yep. <coughs> he said, first of all, uh, would you let your child play in this in its current state? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, OK, it's completely destroyed. <coughs> Um, even though there were some vestiges standing, it was completely destroyed. And his second question was, um, if you were going to leave here, would you take this with you? You know, if it were still intact, would you take it with you? And I said, no. He said, okay, so it's a permanent structure and it's been completely destroyed. Great. It's an outbuilding. <laughs> <coughs> and then there was another chunk of um, stuff that was for landscaping. And it was like landscaping, we live in the woods. And he said, oh, you know, replacement of trees counts as landscaping. <clears throat> I said, all right, well, how do we handle this? He said, well, we're gonna walk around and count the number of trees that have been completely destroyed and therefore should be replaced. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm allowed to give you up to a certain maximum number of dollars per tree for replacing trees. And it, you know, it took standing in one place and kind of looking around and doing this to get to the limit in, of coverage and to decide to write us a check for that. So that was all pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> the other interesting thing that I'd never really thought about very much, but I guess I picked the right option at the time, is the difference between replacement cost coverage and actual cash value coverage. The people who had the cheapest policy terms had actual cash value coverage. What that means is when your house goes away, the insurance adjuster wants to know when did you buy that and what did you pay for it, and then they do the depreciation calculation and figure out what they think it was still worth. Which <clears throat> in a lot of cases when you do capital uh, calculations like that, uh, if it's old enough, it's basically worth 10% of what you paid for it. That's what it sits at until it's no longer useful. So for a lot of folks in the US, that was pretty harsh. That meant that they had you know, a certain amount of coverage for the contents of their house, and they weren't able to get anywhere near the limit. Julie and Joe? They had no idea how to value any of that. So I was lucky. I had a replacement cost policy. <clears throat> now, for the contents, that was really cool, because I said, OK, so what you're saying is <clears throat> you would pay the replacement whatever it costs to replace the stuff that I had. And they said, yeah. I said, okay, we have a problem because a lot of the things I had are not going to be replaceable. And they said, well, you know, closest currently available equivalent. I said, fine. Um, so the game then became how little personal strife do we have to go through? How little can we think about the details of all the little things we had and max that coverage out? And so, not surprisingly, we started with the most expensive things in the collection. And by the time I got to the end of the RF and microwave test equipment, and the end of the CNC machine tools, and the auto repair tools, and the welding gear, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the <coughs> uh, we never actually had to put my wife through the uh, stress of thinking about everything in her sewing studio, because we got to the point where we'd hit 95% of the limits of coverage by the time we'd done about 50% of the floor space. And they said, yep, OK, you win. Um, we're going to pay out the full policy amount. Um, now, I will mention that there was one oddity in all of that. Um, they looked at my long <coughs> list of RF and microwave test gear, and the adjusters <coughs> didn't say anything right away. But about a week later, I got a phone call, and they asked me if they could ask me some questions and record the call. And I said, OK. And after a few of the questions had been posed and answered, I realized that what they were after was, isn't a lot of this actually business equipment? This couldn't possibly be personal property, could it? <clears throat> and 
I'll bore you the details of the rest of the conversation. The bottom line was they finally got around to asking the important question. Have you ever taken a business tax deduction for any of these items? And I said, no. And they said, okay, personal property, we're done. And so in the end, <coughs> they maxed that out. The weird part of having replacement cost was on the structure because the very first thing I said to them is, we're going to rebuild on the same property, it will not be the same house. So how do you handle replacement cost coverage on a structure if you're not actually gonna rebuild the exact same structure? In the case of my insurance company, they flew a guy up from Texas who spent two days sitting with me on the property and, and answering a lot of questions and so forth. And in the end, he drew a set of plans for the house that had been destroyed and costed it out as if they were going to build that house. They used that to determine what in our local market it would have cost to replace the house as it stood. And they said, yep, okay, that's how much we owe you. And that was a really fascinating process. I don't really ever wanna go through that again, but <clears throat> it's a whole lot better than being handed less money. Okay, so <laughs> what do you do to try and recover from all this? Um, I've had lots of people tell me that they were sort of startled at how quickly we recovered from this whole incident. And I've never really known what to make of that. I, I certainly have friends who six months after the fire still hadn't quite really finished with the crying process. Um, we spent about one night on that. And you know, we got the word Thursday about 10, 10.30 p.m., something like that. <clears throat> and by the next morning, um, my wife and I realized we needed to just take ourselves off, you know, alone, go find lunch somewhere and talk about it, make a few big decisions, and we did. Um, it took us, you know, amusingly, less than five minutes to decide that we're gonna stay, we're gonna rebuild on the same property. And once we'd made those decisions, the rest actually just was really easy. <clears throat> I mean, it's really hard, but it wasn't, it wasn't difficult to make the decisions. It was just tough to do the things. So the first thing I realized is that um, being homeless really sucked. <clears throat> and the idea that you know, we were sort of stuck living in somebody's basement, as nice as our friends were and as grace, grateful as I am for them taking us in and keeping us for a week plus, uh, we really needed to find somewhere to live again and to do it fairly quickly. Um, amazingly, on the Friday afternoon, after we had lunch together and made those decisions, we stopped by a Super Target store to pick up a few more essentials. I think we needed some more shampoo and toothpaste and stuff like that. And as we came out of the store, my wife looked up the hill and pointed to this relatively new, very nice apartment complex and said, you know, while we're over here, we should go up and walk into their office and just get a brochure. And I said, sure. Um, the following afternoon at 1 p.m., we'd signed a lease and had a set of keys. So we were just lucky that the very first place we looked had a, an apartment that was adequate to our needs and uh, we were able to take care of the being homeless part you know, within less than a day and a half after getting the word that the house was gone. Another piece of advice I got early on that we took to heart and I would pass along to anybody else in a similar situation is minimize the amount of stuff you buy expecting to throw it away. What I mean by that is when we went to populate the apartment, <clears throat> we sort of had a choice with furniture. You could rent some stuff, you could borrow some things from friends, uh, you could buy some stuff that would only work in the apartment but wasn't you know, sort of at the quality level you'd wanna have when you move back into a house. And the advice we got was don't sort of spend money on stuff that you don't wanna keep. So actually, you know, we've outfitted our apartment with things consciously thinking about, is this something we would still wanna have once we get back into a house that we're gonna live in for the rest of our lives? And that means that, you know, it sort of minimized the amount of time until it started to feel like home. And we realized that these were our new things and they would be our things, you know, for a long time. I also thought it was really important <clears throat> to put a couple things back to normal as quickly as possible. And you know, the insurance company showed up on the Monday morning after the fire and handed us an initial check and a Visa debit card with a bunch of money on it and a huge big binder with a copy of our policy and a lot of process information about how this is all gonna work. They were really great. It was just sort of amazing. But it meant that we instantly had cash in hand that we could use to go solve a few problems. And the first thing was my son, as I said, was at the skating rink at the time of the fire. Um, unfortunately, his cell phone was on the table by his bed in his bedroom, and so it was gone. Um, the power had been cut and his room was dark, and <coughs> when my daughter was rushing through looking for things, she managed to grab his guitar, which was kind of amazing of her, but not the phone. 
And uh, for 14 year old, uh, not having his phone was really rough, not just on him, but on his friends. It took me, I'm ashamed to say, almost two days to get around to asking him if he wanted to borrow my phone to check in and see how his friends were doing. And uh, they had about decided that he must be, you know, dead and gone on Facebook or something because he just, you know, they couldn't reach him. And um, so, <clears throat> uh, to my great pleasure, a, a very dear friend immediately coughed up a really nice phone for him uh, out of a collection of ones he was no longer using. And we went and got him another SIM card and, you know, he was back in operation within a couple of couple more days. The other thing is that not long before the fire, I had just bought a new um, Vizio digital internet capable TV thing for the living room in the house. It was a lot of fun actually. And um, we had all just basically gotten over the hurdle of learning how to use it and how to drive the remote control. And it's like, oh God, I don't want to go through that again. Um, <coughs> And it's the classic thing where, you know, up or down, one or two clicks in size, it's like the UI was different, you know, different generation. I'd bought the Wizzy new one, of course. So I just made a command decision. The day we moved into the apartment, um, I went down and bought the exact same TV again. And my son and I found a suitable stand for it and we set it up in the living room. It's slightly larger than necessary in a little apartment, but, <laughs> well, you know, like, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> but in all honesty, hmm? well, so the funny thing was, um, yeah, I, we were keeping all the receipts for everything, and uh, it took about uh, three weeks, I guess, before they finally agreed that, oh, yes, we had documented that we had exceeded the limits of the coverage, at which point they said, forget the receipts, we're just gonna write you the max size check and we're done with that part of the coverage. And at that point, I got to go shred the huge pile of receipts and not deal with all that paper anymore. I'm really bad with paper. Um, <clears throat> but another thing that we went and did really quickly, you know, um, as you could probably tell, for those of you who've met my wife and kids and have hung around with me before, um, we are very, um, activities oriented, project oriented, we make things. And so I realized very quickly that, you know, we needed to, <clears throat> um, you know, get my daughter some art supplies and we needed a creative outlet. So um, another thing that we picked up really quickly was another 3D printer and that's a Lulzbot Taz. I can't say enough nice things about the guys at Lulzbot. When I went to their website and went to order one, they were not available because apparently the new Taz at that time had you know, they've been totally overwhelmed with orders and way behind. And because I knew the guy that had started the company, it's in Colorado up in Loveland, I think, I uh, sent him an email and said, okay, dude, you know, when am I actually gonna be able to buy one of these? Um, and they sort of dropped everything and, and sent us one of the prototypes, um, which I just thought was amazing. And it's been great. Um, my son realized, you know, the day after it arrived that he didn't have a comb anymore. Instead of walking down the hill to the super target, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not kidding and you know door stops for the doors and uh, it was amazing how all of a sudden you know little problems that came up became an opportunity to go play with the 3D printer and do <laughs> <coughs> I, I, I can't tell you know it sounds like I'm being frivolous about this but it, it really genuinely honestly was part of the whole healing process was to kind of get our heads back in the you know, we're makers, we do this kind of stuff, this is how we're gonna recover. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing, we got some advice that was wonderful to just treat this like, you know, what you would do at a, uh, at a wedding or something like that and put some registries together and put them up because there are people kept pinging us and saying, what can we do to help? What can we do to help? Well, when you move into an apartment that's not furnished and you don't have any stuff, um, one of my daughter's friends, who's a professional chef, um, uh, my daughter reached out to her and the two of them colluded over uh, some combination of text messaging and email. And they put together a list of sort of the optimal minimal set of stuff to do real cooking in an apartment sized kitchen. And it was amazing. Um, that all got put up as a registry. And um, one evening I added the URLs to the temporary web server and uh, those of you who participated, thank you so much to everybody else in the world. I was amazed, 12 and a half hours later, everything had been fulfilled. And um, 
for the next two or three weeks, uh, every delivery truck company in the world hated us because <laughs> <laughs> they had to lug boxes of just about everything up two flights of steps to the apartment. Um, but anyway, okay, so then we sort of transitioned from that into cleaning up. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details on this except to say that um, it was cathartic in some sense for us to actively participate in trying to <clears throat> shovel through some of the debris. We took out several hundred kilos of copper and aluminum. Copper these days is worth, I don't know, in the U.S., on the order of five bucks a kilo. So um, that felt amazingly worth the effort. Um, we had some, <clears throat> you know, silverware that had been given to us when we got married. And unfortunately, there were a total of maybe two pieces out of the entire collection that, you know, were even worth keeping just to look at, much less to use. Um, but we did actually locate the rest of the blob of melted metal and took that in and uh, sold it all. My son and I lifted and heaved about six tons of scrap metal. Um, actually, I should say we lifted and heaved it all twice, except for on the last load where we cheated a little bit. Um, and in the end, we really found very little that was intact enough to be worth keeping. It was really a few ceramics, uh, stupid little... Um, thing I was, a ceramic uh, cup thing I was using as a pencil holder on my desk office space in the basement actually survived almost entirely intact. And a Japanese doll I had been given in Japan on my first trip there uh, got hot enough that all of the painting and decoration and everything was gone, but the remaining pristine white porcelain doll is in and of itself rather striking. So um, here's a dear daughter sitting in my son's project car trying to find the brass commemorative plate. That was a 1977 Porsche 924 Martini and Rossi special, special edition, which was just about roadworthy again. <clears throat> and the, uh, unfortunately, she did find what was left of the little brass commemorative plate. It was a few drops of molten brass down on the bottom. We had lots of help shoveling through things. That's actually my son's skating coach and her husband and some other friends who came over to help. You can see by this point, we'd separated out a lot of scrap metal. We'd pulled the cars out of the way and, you know, we're shoveling through looking for things. I mentioned that we didn't quite have to lift everything twice. The last load we took down was right at the end of the day and <clears throat> the guy driving the big, huge crane that they use for offloading from the commercial trucks hollered down from the top of his crane, would you like a little help? <clears throat> <laughs> And I will tell you, one of the coolest parts of this whole process was watching this guy as a total pro reach into our wood-sided trailer with this freakishly large hydraulic claw thing, pick stuff up, kind of fling it back, swing it forward and let go at the end of the swing, and it would end up on top of that pile. It was just... <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> you know, outside of the foundation itself, um, I, you may have already noticed in looking at a couple of the photos that there's more green around than you would have expected. In fact, you can see in this photo, one of the amazing things is because our house was taken by blowing embers and not by the worst part of the fire rushing through, there's only about a quarter or a third of the trees on the property were totally destroyed. And in fact, uh, even now, it's back to looking moderately normal. Now you have to drive through some post-apocalyptic Martian landscape to get to my house, but once you get there, it's pretty nice. And in fact, a few things, strangely enough, survived. Uh, this trailer, for example, this is the one I took to rocket launches. Uh, it's what we set up as a, as a mobile uh, workshop at, at launches. And you notice how there's some pink dribbly stuff on the side of it? One of the fire chiefs was on the site one day while we were shoveling through and cleaning up, and he looked over at the trailer and he kind of chuckled. He says, you know why that's still there, don't you? I said, no, I have no idea. <clears throat> and he said, well, you see how bright and glinty it is? made a great target for lining up the drops. <laughs> <coughs> and in fact, there was evidence that they had put down, you know, a V of retardant trying to protect the house on the second time the fire came back through. And in fact, had been successful at stopping it. Unfortunately, it just wasn't good forever. Um, so anyway, as I said, you know, we focused on human things first, but then <coughs> I also run this small business at home uh, with Keith that I've given talks about before. We managed to get a net presence back really quickly, but not so much on the uh, actually being in business. That didn't happen until the end of November. I'd also made this commitment to host AJ and Mike Beatty from New Zealand to come do level three high power certification projects at this big launch that happens in the end of August every year. And that caused me to have sort of a positive motivation for getting a workshop thrown back together in a hurry. 
So we got in a garage unit in the apartment complex and set up, you know, pretty rapidly a whole bunch of tools. Um, there's probably the biggest box that arrived. This was with the uh, completely ready to go CNC router. It's my son, you know, looking quite pleased with himself for helping me get the box taken apart. Um, I very quickly went and bought a couple of rocket kits so that um, A, we'd have a chance to get back involved in that hobby, which is kind of part of the human thing, but also so that we'd have some test vehicles for prototypes of new boards since we lost all the airframes that we'd had before. Um, by the end of July, last weekend in July, this is Robert out at one of the launch sites in Colorado where we had successfully flown and recovered that airframe. Since it came in uh, black uh, fiberglass, he named that one Back in Black and uh, <clears throat> enjoys playing a little ACDC before it takes off every time. Um, by mid-August, AJ had arrived. <coughs> um, and these were the parts of the kit that he started with and modified to turn into a big high power project. Uh, Mike Beatty, substantially more ambitious, started with you know, raw materials. Here he is, uh, fiberglass and carbon fiber onto a plywood fin substrate. Uh, we ended up taking them out over Labor Day weekend at the end of August to our favorite launch site in southeastern Kansas. Um, you can see AJ's finished rocket in red there, and I believe, no, that's the one that I built on the ground there. I don't know where Mike's was at that point. Oh, there it is in pieces over behind my son in the grass over there. And there you can see what the trailer looks like in a normal situation. Uh, here's Mike successfully uh, recovering the airframe after his successful L3 certification flight, <coughs> which was amazing. Uh, these guys, they attracted a lot of attention at the apartment complex, uh, sitting in the, <coughs> <coughs> you know, working in the garage until one or two every night. Um, or people would come by and ask what they were doing, and in these, you know, brilliant Australian and New Zealand accents, they'd say, we're building rockets! <laughs> <laughs> And then the very next day, um, there's the sweet smile of success as AJ was recovering his uh, airframe after its level three cert flight. Um, it's interesting that, you know, by the time these guys did this, I had not actually flown a rocket again personally after the fire. And I had been sort of putting a kit together slowly, but I was so busy sort of helping everybody else that I hadn't really got it finished up. Um, they were all quite insistent that I finish it though. And a good friend uh, who's a motor, designer and manufacturer uh, handed me a test load to go demo for him. And so on Monday morning, uh, uh, September the 2nd, I guess it was, the actual Labor Day holiday, uh, that airframe went to Mach 1.8 on the way to six kilometers above ground in a completely successful flight, flying a prototype of our new Telemega board. That's my son, Robert, you know, <coughs> doing the GQ thing with the airframe. Um, once you have all those tools and sort of workshop set up, it's not all about rockets though. Um, Robert also plays the guitar and has a band now. And uh, when he saw this CNC router and how big it was, it uh, didn't take long before he said, hey dad, um, could I mill a guitar body on that? And uh, next thing you know, he did. Um, it's kind of fun having a CNC router because, and having a loaner laptop from Samsung that has a touch screen um, because he was able to play with a touch screen, signing his name in Inkscape, turned that into a tool path, routed it, filled it with a different color wood filler so that when he stained it, he's actually got his signature in the front of the guitar. And uh, it's all been finished up. It's a really awesome sounding clone of a Fender Telecaster. And uh, you know, for about a dime on the dollar of what it would have cost to order one from the Fender custom shop, he's got a full custom Telecaster and it's great. And uh, <clears throat> you know, um, for those of you interested, uh, one of the other things that did not get destroyed was the dish that I used for Moonbound stuff. Unfortunately, all the electronics was in the basement on the bench at the time. Um, so it'll probably be a little while before this is back online, but the mechanics of the dish and all are there and this is another little piece of evidence that not everything is black and cindery. So <clears throat> that's pretty much all we've got. I, the one last thing I wanted to say is that um, there was a point in the middle of this whole process where somebody we didn't know did something completely, completely unreasonably nice for us. And my daughter, who can be a little quick at times to turn everything into a joke, turned to me and said, Dad, that just knocks the cynic right out of you, doesn't it? 
And so if I had to tell you one thing that I've learned through this whole process, it's that people are awesome. And thank you all very much. <clears throat>